Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. and I am the International Affairs Officer for the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Council, I welcome you this evening to this Foreign Policy Panel event and World Affairs Today program. In tonight's event, U.S.-Russia Relationship, Old Rivalry, New Age, we explore the relationship between the United States and Russia 20 years since the dissolution of the USSR and the end of the Cold War. Russia's profile on the international stage is increasing. In 2014, it will host the Winter Olympics, and in 2018, the FIFA World Cup. Russia has been active in the field of international politics as well, with the country's stance on Syria, NSA information leaker Edward Snowden, and its domestic policies gaining international news. At each of these points, Russia has appeared counter to the United States, the old adversary, in spite of the reset of relations in 2009. There are questions as to whether Russia is attempting to regain its sphere of influence over former Soviet republics. But is this a case of benign behavior being misinterpreted? This and other activities present an ever-changing political dynamic in the international community. Joining us for this discussion this evening will be Dr. Donald Jensen and Dr. Fiona Hill. Dr. Hill is the director of the Center on the United States and Europe and is a senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. From 2006 to 2009, she, she was a National Intelligence Officer for Russia and the Eurasia, in Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. Dr. Jensen is a resident fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at the Paul H. Nietzsche School of Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins University. He was the Director of Research and Analysis at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and a Foreign Service Officer from 1985 to 1996, where Dr. Jensen served as Deputy Chief of the Political Internal Section at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, as well as a Political Officer in Sofia, Bulgaria. Moderating tonight's program is Anya Schmechman, Assistant Dean of Communications and Administration at the School of International Service, American University. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, where she worked for nine years and was director of its task force program. Ms. Schmechman is a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for National Interest. Her commentary on Russia has appeared in numerous publications, including The Atlantic. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you all for being here this evening. This is certainly a very topical issue, U.S.-Russia relations. Russia has been uh, in the news lately, and uh, we couldn't have a really a better panel to join us this evening, so I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Fiona Hill and Dr. Donald Jensen to discuss this issue tonight. In preparing for uh, tonight's session, I just Googled Russia and looked at some of the headlines. And the headlines that screamed out were really mostly negative. I jotted a few of them down. Russia in a battle for Ukraine. And there's plenty along those lines. Russia threatens Ukraine. Russia bullies Ukraine. Russia under fire ahead of the Sochi Olympics. A cold, cold war. Russia eyes the Arctic. That was some news this week. Russia versus Greenpeace. And it continued. And those are just the headlines from the last week. So US-Russia relations are to say the least, a little rocky right now. And Russia's being seen on the world stage uh, as a bit of a negative player. So um, I'm going to start tonight with a couple questions to our panelists. We're going to survey US-Russia relations and then take a closer look at domestic um, issues inside Russia. We're also gonna talk a bit about Ukraine uh, this evening because there has been a lot of very interesting developments that continue in Ukraine today. I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Jensen. Don, on the global stage, Russia has typically played the role of a spoiler, a blocking the United States and allies at the UN National Security Council and generally being rather difficult. Uh, in September of this year, um, 
Russia intervened in the Syria crisis and uh, was sort of seen as a bit of a global hero by helping to defuse the crisis by offering a solution to the chemical weapons issue. Um, meanwhile, the so-called reset of relations with Russia has been reset and reset again, uh, but the results really are quite unclear. So how should we really view Russia today? Is it an adversary? Is it an on again, off again friend, something else? Um, with all this talk about a renewed Cold War, should we really view Russia in a much more realistic lens as... I jumped at that word, realistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, as mentioned, a fellow at the Center for the National Interest. Um, so, so realistic is, is a word that I do like to use. Um, but should we view them as simply a strategic partner when our interests happen to converge and not a strategic partner when our interests don't converge. What's the best way for us to look don't, at Russia Don't you today? love the way the moderator wraps 18 questions into one <laughs> question? Uh, so in our common graduate schools, I, I long ago learned to be a landscape explorer and not a hypothesis tester. And oh, good. So let me tell you uh, where I come from in general about Russia, and if you read my weekly blog, I think it, you'll see it reflected there. One, I think I disagree with Governor Romney last year. Russia is neither a friend nor an enemy. But it, it's need not a partner either. It's a country in which we can cooperate uh, on issues of mutual interest. Uh, second, I think Russia is uh, very, especially the elite, is uh, often anti-American, often envious of the U.S. position in the world, and often insecure and acts accordingly, and defines itself in the examples, some of the examples you gave, uh, as taking the not American position, often it would seem against what other people would consider its national interest. And third, and I refer to a Twitter I read this week uh, from a protester on the Maidan barricades, uh, Russia respects only those it hates. And I would change it slightly to say, Russia respects strength. And this makes the task of diplomacy on Syria or Ukraine or the strategic arms re uh, reductions very, very, very uh, uh, difficult and complicated, but not impossible, and I do think we should work together. I just think, uh, particularly with the reset, without getting into the details, we can talk more about that, it's been somewhat misguided despite the fact there were several concrete achievements, which I do applaud, but I think we are repeatedly uh, taken by surprise on some of these issues. I think we repeatedly th think we share interests with the Russians, strategic arms being an example where we don't in actuality or at least understand them the same way. And I think as a result, uh, the Kremlin has played a relative, comparatively weaker economic and political hand quite effectively in the past four or five years at the expense primarily of the United States. And when I look at the Eurasian space, uh, I see the U.S. influence uh, in generally in retreat across the board or weakening across the board in Georgia. Uh, in uh, Central Asia, in uh, the, Balkans, excuse me, the Southern Caucasus, and of course Ukraine. I think that's very worrisome for me, and it re it's one of the reasons why, despite the many achievements of the so-called reset, I'm glad we're sort of beyond that for now. So when you talk to U.S. government officials, they will say that we have particular interests with Russia and that we need to work with them on the things that matter to us. Uh, a transit route to Afghanistan, cooperation on Iran, on energy issues, um, on some of the large global issues, and on Syria. And I mentioned Syria in my opening remarks, and I wonder if, if you could just uh, tell us a little bit more about your thoughts. It did seem like there was some cooperation early this fall between, uh, a surprise cooperation uh, between U.S. and Russia on this issue. How do you think that the uh, work on Syria has affected the U.S.-Russia relationship now? Uh, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think that one of Russia's primary foreign policy goals is to reassert itself as a great power, often defined as not an American partner. And so we see a lot of things, we see a lot of, a lot of phenomena, one of which is a general foreign policy shift away from Europe and the West. When I was in Moscow Embassy, we thought they would be like a big Czech Republic or Czechoslovak Republic. So Russia is moving to the East and moving to the Pacific and moving to the South moving to the Islamic world. There are a lot of pressures, but certainly away from the West. Syria then, and I would say the mistake of the White House in threatening military action and then backing down, conveyed not for the first time and certainly not for the last time that the Obama administration is not particularly result resolute or decisive 
I hesitate to say weak, but that's really what I'm saying, which Russia could step in, constructively exploit, and I do say constructively, to help us avoid a military action there, to reassert itself in the process. Uh, but it did make the White House look uh, like a, miscal a miscalculator and uh, weak, frankly. The second concern I would have about Syria is that uh, uh, by making the Russian presence so fundamental to the peace process, we are to some extent a hostage of keeping Russia engaged, for which they can extract other concessions, or for, for which they can extract less American assertiveness on other issues. So you take a situation where they cleverly, expertly inserted themselves, they create a situation where we are obligated to Moscow's goodwill on a Syrian issue. And third, it's to my extent, and I've, I recommend the State Department communique the other day of Celeste and Tory in, Washington, in Moscow, they talk across the board about these various issues, but really the, the relationship is dominated by Iran and Syria. It's not dominated about the crackdown in Russia or the corruption in Russia or all those other things. And so it's, re it's re warped the agenda, in my view, of the Syria situation. All of those, I think, uh, are not good for U.S. foreign policy toward Russia. And the conventional wisdom in Washington is that it worked out well even though Obama bumbled into it. And I think that's a bad way to, 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 to carry out foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And for those who may be unfamiliar, Celeste Wallander is at the White House, Tori Newland at the State Department, and both of them are... Handing out donuts in <laughs> Kiev last time we saw her. Managing uh, some of the U.S. Yeah. policy toward Russia these days. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Russia's domestic um, politics in a minute with Fiona, but, but in terms of U.S.-Russia relations, Don, how do you assess the role of personalities? So Putin obviously is this, is this really quite interesting personality, president who, who maneuvered uh, you know, to step back from the throne for a bit and then to put himself back in the throne. It looks like he will be the person in charge for some time to come. Um, and his relations with President Obama uh, don't seem to be very warm. Uh, to say the least. Um, so as we assess, again, the U.S.-Russia relationship today and going forward, how does the role of personalities fit in? It looks like Putin is here at least to stay in the near term. It does. Well, it's a, Putin emerges in a system which is highly personal and power is very informal and often monetized. And I think the personal relationship between the Kremlin leader and the U.S. president is critical. And while they respect the United States, they do, I think, try to take the measure of the man. And I think they've taken the measure of this man and feel that they can, I didn't say, I won't say bully, they can maneuver the U.S. into positions to Russia's advantage. Uh, part of the problem is just a disconnect in general about the agenda. The U.S. side tends to think the strategic arms relationship is very important. I don't think the Russians care that much about it one way or the other, except that they want to keep building mi missiles. And so, we seem to have a disconnect in general about it. And there's a, there's a sense, and I promised I wouldn't say anything about theory, but I'll say it anyway. The national security great power preoccupation of the Kremlin, in my view, parallels sort of the realist approach of many U.S. foreign policy thinkers. So there's a, a natural fit on some of these issues, even as there's a misunderstanding in many cases of the importance of individual issues on the agenda, human rights maybe, or environment, or women's rights, or LGBT. There's a lot of things that we, being, we bring up and the Russians sort of go, what? And, and I think they can, that creates a disconnect in the relationship that makes it very hard to, to do business. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that's a, a natural in, I think, to the next part of our conversation about what's happening inside Russia today. Um, and you know, when you look at what's happening uh, inside Russia, it's fairly troubling. Two years ago, actually to this week, there were demonstrations in Moscow, uh, December 2011, anti-Putin demonstrations in response to deeply flawed elections. Um, and since then, there has been a crackdown in civil society, a crackdown on freedom of the media, um, anti-gay laws, which have received a lot of attention. Of course, Edward Snowden, our own fugitive, taking refuge in the Moscow airport uh, and finding a refuge there. Uh, Pussy Riot, uh, as you all know, the, the girls who staged a protest in, in a Russian church um, and were sent to, in one case, uh, Siberia for hard labor. Um, so it's really impossible to look at the geostrategic relations that we've been talking about without taking into account 
Russia's own domestic trajectory, which has been decidedly uh, in a downward spiral. Um, so to what extent should we be really concerned about Russia's domestic affairs? What influence, if any, does the United States have, especially as we head right now toward the Sochi Olympics, when a very bright spotlight will be uh, shining on Russia? Well, thanks, Anya. I'll mention, um, uh, f first of all, the, I'll respond to the last point that you made about what influence do we have. We have very little. I wouldn't say we have none, but it's pretty close. So that, getting that out of the way, um, how to explain what we're seeing inside of Russia itself. These things are all tied together. I mean, essentially what we have with Putin, and you know, you'd asked Don about the role of personalities, the Russian political system is hyper-personalized. It's based on you know, a charismatic individual, Vladimir Putin. Um, it's uh, something of what one might quip a one-boy network. Everybody who is at the top is somewhat related to Putin, uh, one way or another either from his professional life going back to the KGB, but not entirely, back to his period when he was a deputy mayor in St. Petersburg before he moved to Moscow. And then people who's uh, uh, come across uh, and worked with him in his uh, professional capacities as he rose up through the Moscow ranks. So you've got a very tight web of uh, informal networks that is running in parallel to the state in Russia today. It's something to bear in mind. We often, when we're talking about the domestic situation, are talking about a state crackdown. That's a bit of a misnomer because uh, Russia really is run by a very tight inner circle of people who are not necessarily um, working within the state institutions, but they're using the instruments of the state, the legal system, the courts, and uh, various other measures uh, to uh, control society. Uh, we're meeting today against the backdrop of uh, what was the equivalent of the State of the Union address in uh, Russia. It's called the Poslanya, so it's the uh, address that the President gives every year to the Russian Duma, to the Parliament. And Putin uh, made a number of statements uh, today that really sum up everything we've been talking about. He admitted that he is a conservative politician and he started uh, basically citing a very famous uh, Russian religious philosopher, Nicholas uh, Badaev, uh, who many of you might have read in English and some of you who know Russian probably heard of him, um, and talking about the importance of conservatism of pushing uh, the country forward. And what, did all, what does all of that mean in a Russian context? It means anti-Western, anti individualism. Uh, it's pushing a communitarian uh, point of view. It's the role of the Russian Orthodox Church, which is why we get all of the legislation um, against um, gay propaganda, as uh, the uh, Russian uh, government has been pushing this. Because it's, pu it's embracing an agenda, a fundamental agenda, going back to the basics of Russian history and of Russian Orthodoxy. There was quite recently an encounter between Putin and a group of uh, Russian writers um, which uh, I'm afraid for you know, any of you looking at this with a historian's lens might give some shudders of similar meetings that might have happened in Germany in the 1930s when the uh, writers come together and praise Putin as their leader and so that they've come to express one of them literally says our love for you as our leader and this is um, just I commend all of you to go back and have a look at this and actually talks about uh, the fact that uh, Today's uh, Russian politics are very much like the Tsarist order, which was based on the autocracy, the, uh, the role of the Russian Tsars, orthodoxy, the role of the Russian church, and an idea called narodness, the people, uh, the acclaim of the people uh, for the Russian Tsar. And the, and the uh, writer says uh, to Putin, well, we have the same thing today. We have Putin in the place of the autocracy, in the place of the Tsar. We have uh, back to orthodoxy. And we have, instead of narodness, uh, of this idea of the people just being the single Russian, ethnic Russian people, the Russian speakers, a more expansive idea of the peoples living in Russia itself. Because what we're seeing, three trends in Russia that have really had an impact, I think, on shaping uh, some of the external expression that we've seen, and, and the reason why Putin is clamping down. Three rather negative problems that uh, the Russian government and Putin are facing. One is the slowdown in the economy. So, uh, I mean, you've all been probably following this in uh, the press. Uh, I mean, of, of course, the Russian economy is not slowing down in the way the European economies have been slowing down in the United States economy. But Russia grew for 10 to 12 years by about 7 to 8 percent, which is a pretty phenomenal rate of growth. It's now somewhere between 1 and 2 percent. Best case, it might be about 3 percent. And this just isn't good enough based on uh, previous rates because a lot of expectations of uh, continued economic growth. So the, the Russian government are trying to lower expectations now to get people uh, more of a sense that they're going to have to 
and limit what they can expect uh, out of the future. But it just means that there's not so much money to splash around. There's been an awful lot of money spent on the Sochi Olympics. It's going to be very difficult to do this kind of uh, big mega project uh, again in the future. The second uh, trend is the rise of Russian nationalism. So all of these things that Putin was actually stressing in his address. Uh, there is uh, a very large uh, and growing Russian extremist movement. It's not unique to Russia. It's the kind of phenomenon we're seeing all the way across Europe. It's the phenomenon you see in Marine Le Pen and her rise in France. It's the phenomenon you see with the UK Independence Party in the country that I hail from. Uh, there are certainly plenty of elements of it here in the United States. I won't name uh, various groups, but we're all very familiar with it. It's basically those who want to go back to the conservative base, who want to go back to the fundamental family values, the, the values that Putin is saying that um, he is uh, trying to uh, promote now. And they're also uh, anti-immigrant in the case of Russia, anti-migrant, which is uh, an, uh, something that needs to be explained a little bit more. I mean, in Russia itself, the movement of people, so these people who are not ethnic Russian, around the country is actually extremely unpopular because the profile of Moscow itself has changed. This is the mega city where everyone is going to. And it's basically the immigration debates that we have here in the United States are also the debates in Russia about their migrant population, people coming from outside of Moscow into Moscow. Now, pretty much everybody is from outside Moscow one way or another uh, because of urbanization over the period. But this is predominantly about the Muslim populations from the North Caucasus and the Volga region. Another reason, well, we can get into later, why Putin's worried about Syria, because there's actually some overlap uh, with different groups and things there. And then the third trend is... Um, Mr. Putin himself. He talked a lot about the charismatic leader, but he's not as charismatic as he once was. I have a little chart in here somewhere that um, it's a little deceptive, but um, it just will give you a bit of an idea. This is uh, Putin's approval ratings um, over time. Um, sorry, didn't mean to knock the mic there. And I, mean, I think because we're all close enough here, you can see that the trajectory is not particularly favorable. Now, I have to explain, of course, that uh, Mr. Putin has gone down from the stratospheric popularity ratings of about 80% to about 60%. So if you were a member of Congress or you were President Obama, you'd be pretty darn ecstatic with where your approval ratings were. <laughs> but it's just that the trend is down. And as you can see before, when the trend went down uh, back in 2005, when Putin made a very unpopular uh, decision uh, to monetarize the pension benefits of all of uh, uh, the Russian pensioners, and it got lots of old ladies out onto the streets complaining, the popularity went down. It went straight back up again. Uh, but this doesn't seem to be happening. This looks like uh, one of the ski slopes at the Sochi Olympics, which is all the way down and no ski lift on the way back again. So Putin, although you know he's still looking pretty good, 63.5% in November of approval, um, he, he's not looking as uh, popular as he was before. So Putin has actually gone into uh, that uh, category of all of uh, those uh, long-serving leaders uh, that we know from other settings who just keep on staying on. And eventually, they just don't have the ability uh, to keep pushing up their active support. And when you look at polling across Russia, uh, you actually see when you start to dissect it that Putin's active support is more like only about 37% of the population. So people would actually come out and vote for him, which is why the opposition movement was really uh, very troubling to the Kremlin. Because this is people who were mobilized onto the street, not in favor of Putin. It was difficult to have the counter rallies in favor of Putin. But people who got out on the streets to protest against him. And so they're feeling very defensive. And so everything is seen as attack. Putin genuinely seemed to believe that the US, people like Don, had a hand in, um, because Don writes on his blog many things about Russian democracy. And they literally do believe uh, that we all collectively here have had some kind of hand in uh, stirring up the opposition movement. And then when you translate that to Ukraine, Putin starts to see the same phenomenon at work. There's already been accusations that the Ukraine, what we're seeing in Maidan Square and uh, Kiev Independence Square is less about uh, Ukrainian independence and more about, again, the hand of the United States upsetting things in Syria, upsetting things in Egypt, being behind the Arab Spring, being behind the old color revolutions, as they call them, from the Orange Revolution in Ukraine and um, the Rose Revolution in Georgia. And here we are, we're at it again. Well, thank you. So. That's an interesting analysis, and you're, you're really suggesting that Putin's tightening of power is uh, very much spurred by a weakness, in fact, political weakness, also economic weakness, um, a faltering economy, which he discussed in his State of the uh, Union today, um, and really a fear of rivals um, and, as you said, an insecurity. So if that's the case, looking forward, can we expect things to get increasingly worse as he becomes increasingly fearful and less secure, 
or do we find a time and place where he feels that he has asserted enough control? Uh, part of the news this week was that it was announced um, that Putin was dissolving the, uh, the main state news agency and replacing it with a new agency uh, with his own pick at the head. Um, news that surprised everyone, but in fact, should, if you think about it, really is no surprise, uh, given, given the trends there. Um, but so once he's controlled the media, uh, cracked down on civil society, uh, you know, shaped his image and put his opponents where he wants, then what? I mean, so what are we looking at, you know, three years, six years, ten years out from now? Well, this is all really the big question is about the preservation of the current political system in Russia today. The, the question that we all sort of sit around, well, I mean, we're all very boring, do it over coffee, dinner, and, you know, talk about 24-7, is, is it possible to have Putinism without Putin? You should all be very grateful that you don't spend all day thinking about this as a uh, work. We at, least really we get, at least we get paid for it. Uh. <laughs> anyway, we spend a lot of time actually trying to think about what, what could this possibly look like. It's entirely uh, uh, likely that the system that we see in some form as the way that we've been uh, sketching out this uh, highly centralized, personalized system will continue even if Putin isn't there. I mean, many political systems have a, have a certain permanence. The problem is the mechanism of change. I, thinking of some other uh, long-serving leaders, and I'll use Margaret Thatcher as an example, and my bet is that Meryl Streep will play Putin in the Putin movie too, because she was so good as the Iron Lady, and she does play pretty much everybody. And Putin will probably be around long enough, in fact, uh, for um, Meryl Streep to lose enough hair to be able to play him anyway. But the point is on this that um, they're looking for a way of uh, perpetuating the system. And as long as Putin stays... Uh, popularly legitimate. So he, as long as he doesn't keep, you know, kind of going down into the single digits, which is where Boris Yeltsin ended up. When Putin was picked as uh, Yeltsin's uh, successor back in uh, 1999, Boris Yeltsin had the approval rates in the U.S. Congress. He was about, you know, seven, eight, nine percent. So this wasn't a, a very auspicious moment for him to be able to really kind of pass on the system. And that's why, of course, Putin was able to change so many things uh, after uh, he, he replaced Yeltsin in terms of consolidating what the Russians call this vertical of power, this pretty uh, centralized, uh, centralized system here. And uh, Putin would probably hope to be able to do the same thing. He said right now that he's staying through 2018, his first six-year term of the next two terms that he's got. He's also pretty much said that, you know, if all goes well, or maybe all goes badly, if he can't find a successor, that he's going to stay till 2024. Now, the problem for Putin, because his, his image, his charisma, has been so much uh, based on this action man figure, it's going to be a little bit difficult for him at 72 to be playing the same kind of shirtless roles that he's been doing over the last few years. I'm not sure that any of us would really want to see him doing that. Um, although in Hollywood, we know that there's constant, you know, Bruce Willis still doing it, same age, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, that a lot of people still do this. But he is the leader he, of, uh, of a major country, and he's trying to carve out this new role of being, uh, of being the statesman. So there's the, the, how, how do they pass this on? There's no political party, as there was in the case of Margaret Thatcher, to effect a palace coup. Does this happen uh, from outside of the elite? And I think that's really what we're, what we're looking at now. They're hunkering down this political retrenchment to try to put the instruments in place to be able to effect a transition at some point. Because the wild card in all of this is what if something happens to Putin? You know, what if he'd been flying around with the cranes and that electrolyte and it had taken a plunge? Um, they didn't look like you know, there was um, you know, a safety net underneath him then. There are you know, some risks that uh, one has. And we have a colleague... Uh, uh, who wants to do a scenario about that that caused a great scandal in a kind of a public uh, report, the wild card, you know, that Putin gets assassinated. And it created, you know, kind of a great uh, backlash in Russia because that's the ultimate question that people have. The, the system becomes quite fragile when it's just dependent on this one leader. So you have to then create an atmosphere and, and provide the instruments to be able to carry out the continuation of the system because you can be sure that there's an awful lot of people who are quite vested in this political system, who have a lot of authority, have access to assets, and have pretty senior positions, who would lose that if there was a, a rapid changeover. The problem is we've been sketching out here are the, 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 the trends outside of uh, the circle of people who are you know, trying to uh, contain control are not auspicious for being able to affect a handoff. And elections do still matter in Russia. Russia actually is a democracy. Maybe not in the democracy the way that we want to describe it, but elections matter. 
they're a legitimation of the system. They've been established as that, which is why there were protests around 2011 and 2012, the two elections. And also, popular opinion matters a lot. Putin spends a lot of time looking at these polls, and all of uh, his um, colleagues do too. They're also trying to get control of the polling agencies. You know, so this is another you know, signal here that they want to make sure that you have the legitimacy because it, it gets to this idea of this conservative policy based on the czars. You have popular acclaim. So part of having the charismatic leader, whoever it may be, is they have to have the acclaim of the public. Mm -hmm. So all of this is in the mix. It's weakness, but they want to, at the same time, strengthen the system so that they can be passed on. So it needs to be three to six years out. So I think that's what we're going to be seeing. All the way we're going along is all attempts to be able to make what we have today permanent and be able to pass it on to someone else. And the big risk is if someone comes in from the outside and tries to upset it. Right. The Wizard of Oz had that big thing, remember? He went off on the balloon and parceled out power. Right. Yeah, good. but that's the new Hollywood version of the Wizard of Oz. Not going to work that way. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's, it's troubling. Let's I could add a point to that, though. Oh, I mean, please. There are external things you can do. If Fiona's absolutely correct, he's, Putin's trying to mobilize the base. There are external foreign policy things you can do that help this, mm -hmm. one of which is to be anti-American one of which is to defend Christians in <coughs> Muslim countries like Saudi Arabia and Syria, where the U.S. cares about LGBT, according to the Russians. He cares about defending Chris Christian believers. You could have a nice little war uh, someplace, maybe Georgia, maybe elsewhere. You can uh, get Ukraine back in the fold. There are a lot of things you can do that might help this, and that's another variable to the factors that Fiona discussed. So let's explore that a little. We're going to do a little more talking and then open it up for questions. But let's talk about Russia in its neighborhood, its so-called near abroad. Uh, Russia, of course, is a successor to uh, the Soviet Union, uh, which dissolved. The uh, Soviet Union was made up of the 15 Soviet republics. And it had a uh, sphere of influence in Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain. And those 15 republics have gone on in various directions. The Baltics, uh, of course, have pretty firmly joined Europe. Uh, the Central Asian republics, uh, some differences there, but most of them are looking toward China these days. Uh, Caucasus, quite troubled. Um, obviously, uh, a recent war uh, between Georgia and Russia. Um, Azerbaijan, oil rich, but uh, feeling a little uh, dissed, I guess, by the United States these days. Um, and then Armenia, uh, which had been moving toward the EU and the agreement uh, with the EU, and then uh, suddenly uh, turned around uh, and said it would join the Russian Customs Union. And now these past couple weeks, all the spotlight has been on Ukraine. Um, but before we get too deeply into Ukraine, let me ask you, Don, about the bigger picture here. Um, I mean, are we looking at, you know, again, a renewed Cold War, a, a, a geostrategic tussle? Is it East versus West? Is that really the best way to understand these, these issues um, as competition, pure and simple, us versus them. We want to lock these countries into the West. Russia wants to pull them East. Um, and it's all about uh, sort of a new great game. Is, is that one way to look at it? I like the way you packed the question full of all these good things. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's it. it is not a new Cold War for many reasons, one of which is there's no strategic real strategic threat to one another. There's no ideological competition. This is about Russian great power status. I would say, however, that if there is competition in especially, can we still say near abroad? The near abroad. Well, they uh, said it, but yeah. The Obama administration correctly wants to see this as not a zero-sum game, which I've read a thousand times the past few days. Unfortunately, I think the Russians do see it much more as a, a zero-sum game. So you, uh, you see a general a turn of attention by the White House away from that region. But you see, as I mentioned earlier, Russia turning toward Eurasia and away from the West first. Second, trying to reassert influence in the former Soviet space. But that influence has, li the ability to do that has limits, one of which is the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. economic, for now, threat in the southern rim of the former Soviet Union. One of which is that some especially strong former Soviet leaders, like Karimov in Uzbekistan, can resist and have resisted so far uh, uh, Moscow's uh, flirtation. Other countries, Belarus in particular, maybe Ukraine, are less able to resist. So this, let's call it tension between Moscow and Kiev or Moscow and, and Tashkent, wherever, is much more complicated. My own view is that, is that the Kremlin probably realizes while it wants to gather up 
uh, claimed uh, alleged Russian lands, it realizes it can't do it to all former 15. It doesn't really want to do it for all former 15. And certain countries, Tajikistan, have geostrategic importance for Russia that other countries do not. Ukraine has an obvious importance. So I think they are content, it would be my sense, of, for a multi-tiered approach so long as they are the predominant power in the region. That, I think, leaves in their calculation very little role for the United States. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, just, <clears throat> I want to actually um, quibble with Don here because we haven't really seemed to have disagreed on anything Please. so far. But I actually disagree um, on this uh, ideological front now because Putin's speech today, it'll probably be translated, you know, kind of eventually, and usually it's kind of, you know, reams of translation and you might not have the stomach for it, but there's a, there's a new ideological element that has kind of come into it. Uh, Putin's been saying actually since the beginning of this year, um, and, and almost since his last uh, speech, that Russia is a unique separate civilization. So he's, uh, Don's right that there's no return back to the communist ideology. Everybody who says that you know Putin is an old, you know, died in the wool communist or you know wants to go back to the Soviet Union is wrong, and that's why it's not the kind of the Cold War. But it's and, it, and it's a weird form of ideology because it's a, it's basically an anti the United States, anti the West, and it's and, and Putin today, um, well yesterday, whatever you know day we're really in in um, kind of Moscow right now, uh, try to unpack this a bit. And, you know, why would we keep harping on about the, uh, you know, anti-gay uh, propaganda legislation? Putin actually says this all quite explicitly. Putin is always pretty open about, you know, what he, what he really thinks about things. He basically says that this is, we're going to go back to traditional family values. The majority of people in the world, he essentially says, think like us. It's these Europeans in the West with their so-called universal values, which are no values at all, which are really the problem here. So we're going to take the stand with our unique Russian civilization for all of those who still believe in traditional values, because it's either this or the chaotic darkness. And he uses some old church, Slavonic old church language to express this in. And, and that's important, again, because it's picking up on the themes of the Russian Orthodox Church. The one entity that can mobilize people on the streets in enormous numbers, literally hundreds of thousands of people, is the Russian Orthodox Church. So while you see the hundreds of thousands of people and then the diminishing numbers on these oppositions for, political, uh, for the political rallies after the elections in 2011 and 2012, even larger numbers will come out onto the streets of Russia if there's a return of an icon from abroad or the restoration of a church or on a, on a holy day. And Putin is actually very worried that there might be a diversion of people from the Orthodox Church, as there has been in Russia's and the Soviet past, and that the, the church that might, might produce itself some kind of political trend. So he has to get ahead of this. So he's playing out that possible agenda that some other uh, conservative you know, politician might play. Because in the 90s and at other times, we've seen this. It's familiar in the United States, you know, where there's a separation of church and power, where many uh, groups can get people onto the streets over issues like abortion. You can't do that in Russia. You can't play the abortion uh, uh, issue as a political issue. It's a public health crisis in, in Russia. You can't do an anti-alcohol campaign. Gorbachev tried that, didn't succeed very well. That's actually what Erdogan in Turkey is doing. Uh, you know, there are many other conservative politicians. So he goes for something that he can actually use, which is, and uh, uh, tries to create an ideology around it because there's still great discomfort uh, in uh, Russia with the idea of same-sex marriage and same-sex relationships. And it's something that still resonates uh, broadly with the population. So he's making an ideology on this idea and then reaching out to others now in a way that Russia was not doing before and actually saying, we can bring in other, other countries on this same stance. There's even, in spite of Putin's fears about Islamic extremism, he's actually sponsored meetings with Salafi, Wahhabi, uh, conservative Islamic leaders on this topic of family values to stress that this is a civilizational stand against the decadence of the West. And he actually said the, the other day that we're sexless, barren, you know, basically Rome in our decline. So this is a new element that wasn't there uh, really uh, a I year agree, ago I before. Agree, absolutely. Now, is it really an ideology? I mean, I think we can um, argue about that, but it's a new element that's come in, and I think it's going to be something that's going to be very difficult. And Sochi's going to be, in a way, the battleground mm -hmm. for that. So, yeah, on this issue of values and his history and all the rest, the Russians, of course, most Russians do see Ukraine as a historic brother, as a right. Slavic country, as an Orthodox country, as, as you know, the, the cradle of Kievan Rus, 
Um, so there are some very emotional issues there. But putting aside the ideology and the emotion, uh, there's also you know some hard and dirty facts here, and it really comes down. I think, to money at the end of the day. So just as a quick recap for everyone, uh, you know, by all intents and purposes, by all appearances, Ukraine was marching toward this agreement with the European Union. Uh, Yur uh, Yadukovych, the Ukrainian leader, had said many, many times that that was his intent, was to sign the agreement, and uh, did what seemed to be, at the time, a really shocking about turn the day before he was supposed to sign, saying, I'm not going to sign. Um, and People took to the streets, and now it's in week three of uh, protests in Ukraine, large protests, much larger than they were uh, several years ago during the Orange Revolution. Uh, so there's a standoff now in Ukraine, um, and really all sides pointing fingers and everyone blaming everyone. Um, but what it seems to be, to me at least, is uh, Ukraine is in deep trouble economically, um, and they've been shopping around for the best deal. Uh, trying to get more money from the Europeans, and today clearly trying to get more money from the Russians who've offered them low gas prices. So the standoff continues, and it's unclear where it's going to go. Uh, by the way, one of the best headlines I saw was a Reuters piece, uh, which said the Russian bear has stolen the Ukrainian bride from the altar. Getting back to your <laughs> you know, Russian Orthodoxy theme here. Um, <laughs> And you know, that might be true, Don, that the Russians, uh, you know, really did sweep in and uh, with a package of some carrots and some big sticks said to Ukraine, you know, no, join us and uh, otherwise you're going to be sorry. Um, so how do you think it played out? Is, is played out or how's it playing, going to play out? Played, playing, and will play, but briefly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, uh, I, I, uh, I'll put the U.S. policy toward this aside because yes. I find it deeply troubling. U.S. policy. U.S. has been a bit absent in this whole. Yes, uh, scenario. I, I think well, you're. The donuts, apparently. The donuts. Uh, the donuts. Absolutely. I, I think <laughs> that you, oh, Yanukovych, who uh, was not taken in the Soviet Army because of his criminal record as a high school boy, uh, is a thug basically, and he will take the best deal, and is playing off both sides, and in a. Uh, absolutely remarkable, breathtaking number of weeks of political longer, incompetence, <laughs> miscalculation. He still, the Ukrainians still don't seem to get what's going on in that even, I think this morning, he said overnight, he said he would sign the EU Association Agreement. Uh, but there's also a big meeting at the end of next week with the Russians where I suspect some hard money is going to be on the table, some questions about opening borders, some questions about gas prices will be on the tail, table tabled by Putin, I think that's ultimately the direction he will try to go. I think this last two days of talk is really, uh, I think they were taken by surprise at the scale of the demonstrations and the, the reaction to the violence last Saturday. I think his relationship with Putin, and he's met with him I think at least twice in recent weeks, rarely to any serious coverage about what they talked about, raises all sorts of questions about about uh, uh, what is going to go on and what at the end game will be. And I think the end game will be an attempt by Putin and Yanukovych. Yanukovych really has no choice because I think Bel uh, Brussels sees him largely as damaged goods. I think Putin's not particularly happy with him either because I suspect uh, the th that Putin wanted this taken care of in a little bit more efficient way. And uh, the, the specter of the China trip and the Mo going to Moscow, coming back, Probable deals with the Chinese. There were Ukrainian newspaper reports of Moscow, Beijing discussions about what they, who would give Yanukovych what, and then you have a discussion late yesterday, Fiona, about Chinese possible investment in the Crimea. All suggests that the, the preponderance of, of the momentum, I think, is on the, him and the Ukraine going to to Moscow sooner or later. However, I think over the long term, Ukraine will be part of Europe, even if a very junior part, or partly part of Europe if the bad thing happens and the country splits up. But mm -hmm. I don't think a customs slash Eurasian union of some sort is where Ukraine will end up. Uh, and I think, but I think it's going to be a very painful, difficult process to get Moscow and Kiev to, to come to some kind of understanding that that won't take place over the longer term. If Yanukovych can push this to 2015, Putin writes a check, they cook the election, he takes them into the customs union, 
It's very hard for anybody in the street to change that. Uh, one of the, if you read the EU comments this week, one of the interesting things they always bring up is, well, Yanukovych was legally elected, and the government is legal. It's not like 2004, where there was a stolen election. And so the, in, the intellectual moral argument of the protesters, as much as I sympathize with it, is weaker because mm -hmm. Yanukovych, for better or for worse, mostly worse, is legally there and constitutionally there. That makes it very hard for the processors to argue for some other kind of solidarity type solution. Hmm. So I want to get to questions, but Fiona, quickly on Ukraine. Um, does it really have to be an either or choice for Yanukovych? Is it East or West? Is it EU versus uh, Eurasia Customs Union? And one of the sticking points of the deal was was that the European Union was insisting that he free his political opponent, Yulia Tymoshenko, from jail. And some have speculated that that was really a bridge too far for him. He couldn't make that choice because it meant freeing her, which meant essentially that she would win the next election, which would mean essentially she would put him in jail. So, you know, you, you, Yanukovych is in a difficult spot. Um, I'm, I'm not very sympathetic to him, but he's between a rock and a hard place on a number of different things, between Russia and Europe, between political, uh, different parties, the economic situation really worsening by the day. Um, is there a way to soften the choice for him? Well, actually, as, as it turned out, uh, we all got very much distracted by Timoshenko. In the end, that wasn't the factor uh, that caused uh, Yanukovych to balk at the idea of uh, signing the association agreement. What it was was more what we were talking about, the realization that the Ukrainian economy was literally in the toilet. Um, the Ukrainians seem to have suddenly realized, along with the EU, the IMF, and everybody else at the last minute, that the Ukrainian economic crisis was much worse than anyone had realized, and that Ukraine really needed a massive bailout. And this is kind of where we are now. Timoshenko has been pretty much forgotten. And in fact, she actually wrote a letter. Um, she said she was on hunger strike, actually, at the moment. I hope she doesn't do it for too long, because um, one of the things that, uh, you know, the, the agreement was trying to get her up for medical treatment in Germany because of a bad back and, um, I mean, some genuine other medical issues. But she actually wrote a letter from uh, her jail cell, actually, saying that she wanted them to go ahead, irrespective of what happened uh, with her, to sign the association agreement. So there was actually a lot of back and forth of emissaries and envoys, including the former Polish president and various people going out to try to affect something on Timoshenko. But in the end, it was on another place. And this is where you get to the question of either or. It really actually is an either or question, unfortunately, um, because if it's framed by the EU association agreements and the Russian customs union, the two things are complete and utterly incompatible. The customs union is basically doing business as usual, as it is now. And the EU association agreement means uh, basically taking on all, the, all of EU legislation, systems of governance, and all of uh, the internal uh, market rules and regulations. And as um, all of you, um, you know, well aware, that's a pretty big uh, task. I'm the director of the Centre for the US and Europe, and I, you know, I do have actually in my office all the great big kind of materials and things. I can't even begin to start to read them, and I think that's exactly <laughs> what happened. The Russians and Ukrainians, nobody actually was doing their homework until just a few weeks before uh, the summit where they were supposed to sign. They pick up these massive great documents, they start flicking through them, and there's a, you know, oh, expletive, you know, kind of bubble above everybody's head because they suddenly realize what this is going to entail. Ironically, the Armenians who decided not to sign under Russia pressure had done most of the homework and were right on track uh, to go ahead with their agreement. So, you know, they pulled back at the very last minute. But the Ukrainians had been nowhere close to even uh, starting to really implement any of this legislation. And the Turks have been, you know, a couple of decades now in the process of doing this. It took the Baltic countries and, you know, the Slovakia and the Czech Republic and Hungary and Poland a long time to bring all of this into effect, but it's transformed them dramatically. And that's really what this is all about. It's all about economic, societal and political transformation. If Ukraine basically had an association agreement, signed it, and then, more importantly, started to implement all of this. It's not just a question of trying to put its economy on a different footing, it's transforming the whole of Ukrainian society. We've become much, much less Eurasian, much less post-Soviet, much less Russian, and much less vulnerable uh, to the kinds of pressure, uh, the kind of corruption, because everything would have to be out in the open. We'd really know, you know, about what Mr. Yanukovych's son, who is a dentist, uh, did to become the richest man in Ukraine, or pretty much the richest man in Ukraine. Obviously, a lot of gold teeth fillings, a heck of a lot of gold teeth fillings to become a billionaire. You know, all of these kinds of questions would have been open to scrutiny, as they have been in other settings. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. Now, can we frame it in a different way? We're now in the midst of, you know, basically the battle 
down in the square. Nobody's really putting these issues on the table, but it really is, unfortunately, an either-or proposition. Irrespective of what deal is ultimately made to get that signature, it's the question of what happens next. That's just the beginning of a very long process. Thank you. Well, and, very and Putin has made clear also that it's either-or, and that, yes. as Fiona said, there's a, the, the connection between foreign and domestic policy, policy, especially on Ukraine, is very tight. And so he's also said, you're either with us or, or not, and here's a check, and there's probably going to be some other negative inducements as well. Well, thank you. I'm a very situ interesting situation there to keep an eye on, and it's very cold in Kiev, uh, so we should all be thinking of those protesters. Uh, I think we're ready to move to questions here. We've covered a lot of territory here. We've moved a little bit away from our central topic of U.S.-Russia relations, but really the Ukrainian situation is so interesting right now uh, that I did want to spend some time on that. In Europe now, Western Europe, you know, there seems to be a a debate uh, whether uh, Ukraine's decision a couple of weeks ago, Vilnius, not to sign the association agreement that would bring you know, free trade and closer political relations with the European Union, that that might be a foreign policy failure for the European Union. So some are arguing it's a foreign policy failure, and they're saying Europe is only using soft power with Russia, soft power being a politics of attraction or countries which try to emulate the values of other countries. Um, so they argue, well, there needs to be more hard power. But others say, well, the European Union stopped to its gun. It's you know, guns. It had certain standards, including the release of Mrs. Timoshenko and certain reforms that Ukraine should carry out. If it was unwilling to carry them out, the European Union shouldn't lower uh, its standards. Now, the United States has employed some hard power um, some months ago. The U.S. Congress passed a Magnitsky Act after uh, Russian authorities allowed a, a, a lawyer in jail to, to die who needed medical treatment uh, after he had exposed a scandal in the Russian government. Um, should the European Union have a, a more unified policy toward Russia? Should their policy be a bit more of a balance between soft power and hard power, more like the United States? Or is the European Union doing it the right way with Russia? I think European Union has played this poorly. They were reactive. They came to the problem late, and they didn't provide enough incentives uh, for a unified set of incentives for uh, to get this done, no matter how difficult the Ukraine problem is. I think Ukraine being in Europe is extremely important for you over the long term, in whatever kind of relationship you are. It's extremely important not only for Europe but for the United States, and ultimately it's important for Russia that Ukraine is in Europe. And I think this is a, uh, a major foreign policy gaffe by the EU, but I think the U.S. has much to be faulted for as well, because I think we're all pretty much asleep at the wheel. Uh, I don't think the Russians – I think the Russians were prepared with a set of counter pressures much more than we were. Perhaps they awakened to the problem and Ukraine's alleged ambivalence late, but I think they were responded more effectively and have been, and that's probably why Yanukovych is going to go to the east. I was at a discussion with Radek Sikorsky a few weeks ago, and he was pretty effusive about the checkbooks open in Europe and all that, but I think it may be too late to have the, the checkbook open. Could I add something about the U.S. and Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Uh, on the U.S., how the U.S. is handling this bill, I think our friend Ms. Newland, since she is a friend, uh, handing out is donuts. Well, you said buns. donuts. Uh, <laughs> buns. Buns. Oh. Buns. Yeah. What I read, yeah. On the Maidan is a very moving thing. A tear came to my eye, and as you know, my wife's from Kiev, so it was especially moving. But I don't think that masks a deeper problem in how the U.S. has handled the, handled the situation, because they also came late until last week or so, and Kerry and the others have been very forceful with words, uh, they really, uh, I think, didn't pay enough attention to it or exert enough counter pressure on the Russians. Because I think the deeper problem is that one of the problems with the reset and our dealings with Russia and Ukraine is that we accepted the terms offered by Lavrov and the others in the reset, which is that we have, we're supposed to have a special relationship with Moscow Special kinds of issues have to be, and this plays into the Russian delusion that it's a, 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 a great power with a moral status in the world equal to the United States. I simply don't think that's true. 
I think it's a very clever way the Kremlin has fought back diplomatically to do this. And so, if I can be relatively critical, I think you see a lot of Russia hands in the administration and elsewhere still in love with dealing with Moscow first and dealing with issues like a START agreement as if the Ukrainians are somehow third-rate Slavs who don't really deserve it. It's just Ukraine. And you see patting on the head. And I think that's very insulting. I think ultimately Ukraine will be in Europe. But because the U.S. on the one hand wants to keep these alleged relationships with Moscow going, and I think they're not going particularly well, we're reluctant to push back on the Russians the way we should have about Ukraine until really very last few days, and it's been much mostly verbal. So uh, I like the buns thing, and it moved me, but that should not, uh, I think, mask a deeper problem with the Russia-Ukraine-U.S. relationship that I think is really pretty fundamental in how we handle Russian issues. Thank you for such a fascinating discussion. Quick question. Um, I would be very curious to hear your perspective on the reasons as of why we do not observe the same intensity and magnitude of protests in Russia as we do in Ukraine. Thank you very much. There's not really in Russia right now an alternative to Putin. There's not one that has presented itself. In Ukraine, we're seeing a real alternative to the business as usual has emerged. And people are protesting in favor of having that option. And we, we're really seeing the protests keep on growing. I mean, I think, you know, today they were larger than they were the days before in terms of the deterrence. It also actually does come down, I think, to also the issue of proximity and access. And <clears throat> although, you know, as um, Ambassador Courtney has said, you know, Moldova is extremely uh, close to Europe, Ukraine's close too. Ukraine does have European uh, countries on its borders now, most notably, of course, Poland. There are an awful lot of Ukrainians in London uh, right now, you know, kind of, in fact, they're all over in uh, Europe and in Germany. A lot of them are working in construction. Many of them are there, in fact, most of them are there illegally. But there's a chance for people to actually see. People are traveling more than they were before, and they're sort of seeing what the opportunities and things are. And ultimately, that actually is one of the uh, reasons, um, in, in a, uh, a somewhat stranger sense, of why Russians don't seem to be protesting quite as much. The Russian government has actually opened up the doorways to people. They've literally said, and I've heard Russian officials say it in meetings, if you don't like what's happening here, go live in London. You know, just go there and, you know, kind of hang out there in London and, you know, just, uh, if you want to come back, you can come back, but if you come back, shut up and don't complain anymore. That's actually, it's an open door policy. Ludmila Alekseva, the very famous um, human rights activist uh, in Russia, just said quite recently in an interview, I think it was actually in the last day, that the only human right that has not been systematically violated in Russia is the one to leave and to come back into the country. Mm -hmm. And it's why they have this open door. But the Ukrainians, I think, really thought the door was closing. Because what's their alternative? To go and work illegally in Russia as opposed to go and work illegally in somewhere else. So I think there's, that this is kind of one of the issues yeah. here. This has been a very wide-ranging and stimulating <laughs> conversation. Thank you all, and yes. join me in thanking our fine panelists. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.